Hi everyone, I'm Matt Ozalis, an RF engineer at Keysight. This video series is about designing a stable high frequency amplifier. This is the fifth video in the series. Last time we explored two rigorous measures of stability, which are driving point impedance and return difference. Today we're going to examine a few modern implementations that are related to Bode's return difference. First, I'll show how the normalized determinant function can extend return difference and return ratio to multiple sources. And then I'll talk about a derivation called true return ratio, which is an attempt to unify Bode's technique with a loop gain style methodology. If you want to follow along, I'm providing the workspace that has all of the example circuits I'm showing, and you can see for yourself how to apply the techniques. The link is in the description below this video. All right, let's get started. So I showed last time that to compute return ratio with a simple amplifier and feedback network, I had to actually go inside of the transistor and turn off the active gain element. And that's fine, but most circuits today have more than one transistor and lots of active elements. So what does it take to analyze those types of circuits? Fortunately, two engineers from Raytheon, Wayne Struble and Aria Platzker, showed how Bode's original return ratio technique could be extended to a network with an arbitrary number of active sources using a normalized determinant function of the admittance matrix. I put the reference on the slide so you can check it out. It's definitely a very important concept in terms of stability. So to compute this, essentially the matrix needs to be expanded to accommodate the additional sources. And the denominator, of course, needs to be stable, just like it was for return ratio. That's accomplished by normalizing the transconductance from the active sources, for example, setting them all to zero. Going back to the example amplifier, since there's only one source in here, the normalized determinant function is equal just to the return difference. Now, though, I'll add in another transistor and connect it to the feedback network using an inductor. This circuit now has two active sources, so I need to access each of the internal elements to derive the Y matrix, which means eight high impedance terminations, four per device. As you can see, I've pulled the transconductance terminal pins to the top, and that allows me to apply the terminations from the top level simulation. And then similar to return ratio, I just swept the source on and off, and I do an S parameter analysis. In the data display, the eight port S matrix is converted to Y parameters, and then I take the determinant with the source on and off to derive MDF. Similar to return ratio, the next step is to look for encirclements, and this new circuit is deemed unstable by virtue of this MDF function. This is rigorous analysis extended to multiple devices. Now, many of you may look at this scenario and say, that's great, but I can't actually get inside the device. Maybe you're able to turn off the gain even. You know, there are modeling techniques to allow that. But if you can't get inside the device, the next best thing you can do is to apply NDF to an admittance network which contains the active sources somewhere inside. Of course, you can compute the NDF for any type of Y matrix, it's just a set of determinants. So the idea is to build a Y matrix that contains the active elements. And to do that, you can add probes to the device input and output nodes. This seems to be the way that most engineers these days apply NDF analysis to their circuits. To illustrate, in the example circuit, uh, the best I can do if I can't go inside the device is to apply probe terminations at the I.O. terminals of the transistor. But now there are just four touch points instead of eight across the intrinsic sources because the inside sources aren't accessible from the top level. Now when I run this simulation, still toggling the sources on and off, the result shows that the network is unstable, which is accurate. But I hope you can see that this is no longer a strict application of return ratio. The negative terminals of the gain elements were not an explicit part of the Y network because it's only possible to access the external source node, which was just ground. So information from those four additional nodes in the circuit could be lost in the approximation. It's not to discount the technique, rather I just want to point out the difference between full rigor and an approximation, even if it is a very good approximation. Okay, I want to switch gears now and review a loop gain derivation that attempts to stay true to the return ratio concept from Bode, and this was derived by Michael Tian. It's called true return ratio. Basically, this approach starts by taking a bilateral amplifier. This is kind of like the Hurst approach I showed in video number three, and then applying a simple short circuit feedback across the input and output terminals. Essentially, then you can collapse the resulting network into a one port because the input and output terminals now appear in parallel. And from there, it's easy to compute the determinant and then remove the active terms and recompute. And what you're left with is a formula that represents return difference containing the return ratio, which Tian coined true return ratio. I really like this technique, but to be honest, I don't like the name. Let's see how this holds up for the example circuit. To follow this method, you apply a double injection, just like Middlebrook's technique from video number three, and then you can compute this true return ratio from the results 
using a somewhat complex set of formulas. These are directly from the original paper. And here is the so-called true return ratio on a polar plot. And I'm also going to add to this Bode's return ratio from the last video for this same circuit. And unfortunately, you can see that the two don't match. That said, the true return ratio does still accurately predict the instability in the circuit, so there might be something there. I think it's instructive first to examine why the results don't agree. So I played around some with the simulation, and I found that if you simplify the device model, you can actually get the true return ratio and the Bode return ratio to agree perfectly. So how does that work? Well, I found I needed to remove the source parasitics and the internal feedback parasitics between the input and output of the transistor terminals. And once I did that, the true return ratio will match Bode's return ratio for the same case. Of course, the circuit is significantly modified, but the results match. So why is this the case? Let's return to the key assumption in the derivation of true return ratio, and that is that the negative terminal of the gain element was grounded directly. Well, when you look at the example circuit, you can see that the gain element itself is buried underneath a whole bunch of parasitics. So it's a mistake to assume that this representation of an admittance network which represents an entire transistor model, is the same thing as simply a gain source. And that's exactly the difficulty that we encountered earlier when we applied NDF externally to the admittance network. The overall Y network is not the same thing as a simple transconductance block. I originally introduced this idea in video number two. This is referred to as the visibility problem. In other words, in a simplified model, the gain block is the transconductance element only. All the parasitics around it, including the source degeneration are technically part of the feedback network. That said, this is where my complaints about this technique really end. It turns out that if you view the true return ratio as more of a loop gain, you start to see it's a really good derivation. Maybe it's the best kind of derivation you can get from outside of the device. If you refer back to video number three, this true return ratio loop gain derivation combines the impedance insensitivity of Middlebrook's null injection technique with the bilateral nature of the Hurst technique. And to, to prove it to you, uh, you can actually use Middlebrook's approach on the same topology to get loop gain, and you get this value on the top. And then loop gain derived by Tn is this value on the bottom. And the only difference is that Tn's version includes the reverse gain term. So that makes it bilateral as opposed to Middlebrook's term, which is just unilateral. Okay, just to summarize the last two videos here, a rigorous local analysis is possible on a circuit using driving point admittance, as I showed in the last video. But this is only applicable to one node at a time. A more global rigorous analysis is possible when you can go inside the devices, directly access all of the intrinsic gain terminals, and compute the return ratio or normalized determinant function at those points. If you aren't able to access the intrinsics, you can make an approximation by applying a normalized determinant function to the best guess y network that you can come up with, but you'll still need to go in and toggle the sources on and off, and you won't have complete visibility from outside the device. Or you can compute bilateral loop gain, which is insightful, but it won't give you true rigor unless the circuit is trivially simple. Now I hope it's starting to make sense as to why there are so many techniques out there for analyzing stability. If you can't have complete rigor, maybe the next best thing is to use a variety of approaches. So what I want to do now is turn this paradox of choice on technique around. Instead of thinking about what one technique you should use as a designer, perhaps it's better to use multiple techniques in a complementary fashion because that gives you a different way of looking at the same problem. For example, NDF or return ratio lets you look at encirclements, knowing that you have a stable denominator. Driving point analysis lets you look at impedance as negative admittance. And loop gain lets you look at the network response due to the feedback. Now instead of a tangled web, this is starting to look a lot more like a toolbox. The one problem left is that the analysis for each of these methods is completely different. For loop gain, for example, we needed to break the loop. For NDF, we needed to toggle the sources on and off, and for driving point admittance, we needed to use a generator. That's a lot of work. Well, the good news is, in the next video, I'll show you a way to greatly simplify this simulation problem using a new probe called the WS probe. Until then, be sure to download the workspace and subscribe to our channel for updates. See you next time.